Welcome to second week of Grand Rounds. Good to see you all. I wanted to start first with just a couple of announcements because I wanted to call your attention to some of the upcoming programs that we have. Um, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to do so before I introduce Dr. Steen for his um, Grand Rounds today. Um, I know that you know that this is Women in Medicine and Science Month. And um, I wanted to alert you that we will be welcoming Dr. Altha Stewart here for Grand Rounds in honor of Women in Medicine and Science Month on September 28th. Um, she is the president-elect of the American Psychiatric Association and um, hails from Tennessee as a community psychiatrist, been uh, very deeply involved in um, uh, justice um, for adolescent populations. Um, we're really excited that she's coming. She will be giving her grand rounds entitled Specializing in the Holy Impossible, Women in Medicine, Past, Present, and Future. And then she's going to be giving a career talk and networking lunch, which is entitled Well-Behaved Women and seldom make history, reframing sisterhood to avoid being dismissed. Um, a provocative title, and as always, Women in Medicine and Science Month talks and grand rounds are open to all, and we encourage everyone to attend. And Dr. Beth Stevens, who's an associate professor of neurology from Harvard Medical School, will be here giving neuroscience seminar. She couldn't quite squeeze it into September, so we forgave her, and she's coming October 3rd to celebrate September's Women in Medicine and Science Month. There, there are a couple of other things I wanted to tell you about, though. We are um, also really fortunate to be able to welcome back to McLean K. Redfield Jameson. She's coming on November 2nd. I wanted to highlight two things. Uh, I think you likely know that she's just published a book on Robert Lowell. Some of the research for that book was done here at McLean Hospital. Um, it's been a very highly acclaimed book. She's going to be doing two things with us. She's going to be giving grand rounds um, entitled Robert Lowell, Mania, Genius, and Character. Um, and that's her Grand Rounds presentation, but she's going to be giving a very special um, evening program of Robert, about Robert Lowell, his poetry, and also some of the poetry set to music. We don't have the exact schedule, but it'll be between like 5.30 and 6 as a start, um, entitled Robert Lowell Setting the River on Fire, an Evening of Discussion, Poetry, and Music. So I wanted you to mark your calendar. She very much wants the McLean community to be able to uh, be here for both of those events, and we'll be um, blitzing the airwaves with more about that. And finally, uh, a week later, on November 9th, um, Vikram Patel will be here speaking on global mental health. He's arguably one of the world's leaders on global mental health. He was just became the um, Pershing Square Professor of Global Health in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He just joined the faculty in April, and um, it's very exciting for us to have him and to welcome him to McLean. So that is November 9th. So September 28th, November 2nd, November 9th. So mark your calendars for those things. And with that, I'm going to move on um, to uh, welcome and uh, introduce Dr. Murray Steen, who we are really pleased um, is back with us here at McLean. Um, we had the opportunity to hear from him a few years back. And he's a visiting scientist this fall at McLean Hospital, working with Dr. Carrie Ressler, Dr. Bill Carlison, and a whole host of others. Dr. Steen is Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Family Medicine and Public Health and Vice Chair of Clinical Research in Psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego, where he's also a staff psychiatrist at the VA San Diego Healthcare System. Dr. Steen graduated from the University of Manitoba, completed his residency and post-residency at the University of Toronto and at the NIMH. His research interests are far and wide, including epidemiology, neurobiology, and treatment of anxiety disorders, especially social phobia, panic disorder, and PTSD. He is a world-renowned expert, having written or co-written more than 600 peer-reviewed scientific articles. He is the principal investigator, co-investigator of multiple grants, including um, one uh, where he's co-principal investigator with Dr. Kerry Ressler on a Department of Defense-funded multi-site trial. And I could go on for quite a while, but then he won't have time to talk. So instead, I will just welcome him to the podium. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's really nice to be at McLean. Um, 
Uh, as uh, Shelley mentioned, I was here about four years ago and gave gave a talk here, and it was on PTSD. And so when um, I was asked to uh, uh, speak again this time, I had no idea what I was going to talk about because you know if I'd given the PTSD talk, it would have had maybe three new slides. Um, so instead, Carrie and others said, well, why don't you talk about an anxiety disorder? And we sort of settled on social anxiety disorder, given that um, I was told you hadn't heard anything about it in maybe a while. So that's what I'm going to talk about. One of the things that um, I may have mentioned last time is that um, I was a medical student and spent six weeks at McLean uh, prior to going into psychiatry. And I actually have a very vivid memory of his working uh, assigned to adolescent and family treatment unit. And I remember the day I showed up, I came to the nursing station and the glass at the nursing station was broken. And they explained to me that the individual who I was going to be working with had thrown a chair through the nursing station that day. So that was my introduction to psychiatry at McLean. And despite that, I went on to do a residency in psychiatry. So I have uh, fond memories of, of being here. So social anxiety disorder. Um, let's see here. It's my disclosure, which I'll leave up for about three seconds. There we go. So uh, what I'd like to do in the next little while is talk about social anxiety disorder. It's really going to be a broad overview, a little bit about diagnosis, a uh, fair bit about psychopathology, and mainly idiosyncratically focusing on the things that I think are interesting, and then a little bit about treatment. So I, I think you're all familiar with the symptoms of social anxiety disorder. So these are folks who are afraid of being um, scrutinized, being evaluated by others, and their concern is when they're in those kinds of situations, which for somebody with social anxiety disorder is any situation where there's one other human being in the room, um, that they're going to be viewed as being dumb, um, uninteresting, they're going to say something stupid, and as a result they're going to be embarrassed, it's going to reflect badly on them. Uh, they worry about the consequences of that. You know, so what if somebody doesn't think you're wonderful the first time they meet you? Well, that would be awful. And, you know, kind of all down that pathway of, of uh, cognitions. And uh, people with this disorder can be very distressed and, and can be very impaired. So this is, uh, somebody's wondering why they even bring Harold to the parties. <laughs> But in terms of impairment, this is just to give you an illustration of, of uh, what it can be like to have social anxiety disorder and how it can affect someone's life. So Alfreda Jelinek was the Nobel Prize winner in literature in 2004. And they phoned her up, as, as uh, I've, I've heard they do for Nobel Prize winners, and said, you've won the Nobel Prize, and you know, we want you to come to Stockholm. And she wrote them a note. Um, I, I guess she didn't actually answer the phone. They had a hard time getting a hold of her. And she wrote a note back that said, I'm not mentally able to withstand that. I have a social phobia and cannot stand these large crowds of people, but I will certainly write a speech, which she did. And someone else read it. Um, and she, she didn't actually show up to receive her prize. So not everybody with social anxiety disorder is talented enough that you know, their impairment shows is not showing up to win a Nobel Prize. But it does give you a sense of how the, the extent to which people can go to avoid these kinds of situations when they're concerned about scrutiny. So how common social anxiety disorder? It's actually pretty common. Um, these are data from the uh, National Comorbidity Survey replication. So these are uh, national epidemiological data. They're not data in mental health clinics. They're general population. So 12 month around 6 or 7 percent of people have social anxiety disorder. Lifetime it's higher. What it tells you then is if the lifetime's higher, some people do recover from it. But it tends to be a very chronic disor disorder. There's recent data that I just came across from the World Mental Health Survey. Because one of the things that I think people wondered about is this kind of a 
um, an, a European, American European sort of phenomenon? Do you see social anxiety disorder in other sorts of contexts where people have maybe you know worse things to worry about in their lives? And it turns out that uh, looking at 28 community surveys um, with a, a lot of respondents, that the prevalence rates are actually you know pretty stable and fairly high across all countries. So the 12 month rate there is around 3%. I told you it was about 7% in the US and a lifetime 4%. Um, part of this has to do with the uh, type of social anxiety disorder that's measured, and I'll talk about in the, I'll talk about that in a minute. But the other thing that was interesting that came across this cross-national epidemiologic studies was that a lot of the um, sociodemographic sociodemographic factors that characterize social anxiety disorder are quite similar across all these nations. So more common in younger people, more common in women than men, uh, more common among people who aren't married, lower education, which is a risk factor for pretty much every neuropsychiatric disorder, and lower income, which is also a risk factor for pretty much every neuropsychiatric disorder known to man. Um, one of the things to be aware of, if, if you're not already about social anxiety disorder, is that it's not probably really a single disorder. And within it, so this, these are scores on um, the LSATs, which is the Leibowitz Social Anxiety Scale. It's a clinical sample. And you can see there's a lot of range um, of this distribution on, on, uh, on this score. And usually what we'll say is an LSAT above 70 is clinical and you know we'll put people in treatment studies even with LSAS is 60 and above. Um, but yet here's these people with pretty low scores on the LSAS, 20s and 30s and 40s, who still do meet diagnostic criteria for social anxiety disorder. Those are people who have their fears really constrained to performance situations, typically public speaking, whereas the people with the much higher scores have a much per more pervasive form of social anxiety disorder where, yes, they have trouble public speaking, but they have problems with interacting with people in all sorts of other situations. So it's really kind of two types of social anxiety disorder. And the DSM-5 actually made a change, as you're probably aware, to the classification for social anxiety disorder, whereas they actually pulled out this group of individuals whose social anxiety and fears and avoidance are pretty much only in performance situations. And there's this specifier, the performance only specifier for social anxiety disorder um, to kind of designate those folks. And then everybody else who's not performance only has what we used to call um, generalized social anxiety disorder, which is more pervasive, involves lots of situations, involves interacting with people in small groups, and is by far the most impairing and severe form of the disorder. Actually, I actually don't know if you can read that at all, but um, a little context. So yes, that is a urinal. Um, and I went into a new building at UCSD, and um, they just built this. And, and actually, next to the urinal is a sign that says, this fixture uses recovered condensate water, do not drink. And I was sort of thinking, what place needs to put up a sign to tell you not to drink out of a urinal? Um, anyways, nothing to do with social anxiety, but in terms of DS DSM-5, um, it is important to kind of pay attention to some of the changes that have been made. And, and for social anxiety, it was a big change. So Mark Twain once said there are two types of speakers, those who are nervous and those who are liars. And this is the specifier that uh, DSM-5 now includes that I mentioned. So in DSM-4, we uh, referred to people with generalized social anxiety disorder. DSM-5, for strange reasons, decided to flip things around and specify the group of people that has performance-only fears. And those are the majority of people in the general population. And that's the reason why you can see uh, prevalence rates reported being from 2% to 10%. The lower rate would be people with this more severe, pervasive form of social anxiety disorder. Um, there's a lot of uh, comorbidity and kind of conceptual overlap between social anxiety disorder and a lot of the other disorders that we treat and see. And certainly shyness by itself and even social avoidance isn't enough 
to uh, qualify for social anxiety disorder, but that is the core. And people who have a lot of those symptoms and a lot of impairment have social anxiety disorder. But there are other uh, disorders that have social anxiety and shyness or avoidance as part of them. I mean, one of them, interestingly, is schizophrenia. And there's been studies suggesting that a fair bit of the impairment, attributable functional impairment attributable to schizophrenia, actually has to do with the with social anxiety. Uh, Autism spectrum disorders, social awkwardness, and um, communication deficits are uh, part, uh, important part of that disorder. But social anxiety disorder almost seems counterintuitive, um, is the most common um, mental disorder among high-functioning individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Lots of overlap with depression and panic and OCD. And, and then, um, I won't get into this, but body dysmorphic disorder, which is sort of really interesting to think about. So body dysmorphic disorder is, of course, the, the fear of imagined ugliness, the fear that there's something about your appearance, your outward appearance, that others are going to notice and they're going to think badly of you as a result. Whereas social anxiety disorder is the belief that your outside may be fine, but there's something wrong with you inside. And other People, if they get to know you, are going to find that out and think badly of you. And um, there's, I'm sure you've seen patients where it's kind of, they either have both or they're somewhere in between, uh, but probably a lot of shared neurobiology that really hasn't been uh, greatly explored yet. Just mention avoidant personality disorder. So we still have this, you know, real funky thing in DSM where we, even though we don't have these axes anymore, we still have personality disorders and we still have other disorders and it's very clear that people who have severe social anxiety disorder if you take those people on that LSAS histogram and you take the people who have scores over a hundred they're all going to meet diagnostic criteria for avoidant personality disorder does that mean that so severe social anxiety disorder and avoidant PD are two different things no I don't think so I think what they are is really just two ways of, of thinking about the problem um, I I tend not to think much about avoidant personality disorder other than when I see it, I, I know that it's kind of a marker of social anxiety severity because I don't really know how to treat avoidant personality disorder and I have some idea of how to treat social anxiety disorder so that's kind of the framework that I tend to go with. Uh, social anxiety is familial. Um, these are very, very old data. Um, where we did a family study, we blindly interviewed first degree relatives of people who had performance only social anxiety and there was no increase in that among first degree family members. People who had what used to be called generalized social anxiety disorder and now would be the non-performance subtype of social anxiety disorder and fully one of every two first degree relatives of probands with generalized social anxiety disorder had a family member with that disorder and then there were also uh, increases in avoidant personality disorder not surprisingly um, in in that family study so it's runs in families doesn't necessarily mean that it's heritable or familial in in the genetic sense so we can look at twin studies um, we, we have done, and there are also other twin studies that have looked at uh, social anxiety disorder per se. What we did here is we looked at this core uh, cognitive belief set and concerns about negative evaluation, which you can measure on a scale. And measuring it on a scale gave us a lot more power than just yes, no disorder. And found, oops, sorry. And found that it was actually quite heritable uh, as a trait. Skip that. Um, in kids, so social anxiety disorder, I think I mentioned, tends to start early in life. Um, and particularly the more pervasive, you know, non-performance only generalized type um, will start very early in life. And sometimes you'll ask uh, individuals with social anxiety disorder, when did this start? And they can't 
tell you when it started. They've always been that way. They were shy kids. They were inhibited. Uh, parents had to stop having birthday parties for them because they'd cry when they were the center of attention, wouldn't speak up in kindergarten, that kind of stuff. Um, and we recognize that social anxiety disorder can actually be, be diagnosed early in life. And when you do see it in young individuals, it tends to be part, not always, but it's very frequently part of this triad where you see social anxiety disorder, but also GAD symptoms and also separation anxiety disorder symptoms. And it's almost as if it takes some additional development to kind of um, branch out and have primarily one of these disorders or the other. Selective mutism. So this is a, a really, how many of you have uh, seen kids with selective mutism? It's quite a few, okay. So this is a really neat problem, not if you have it, but studying it. Um, these kids with selective mutism have normal language skills, um, you know, normal IQ, develop their understanding of language as far as we can tell normally, but fail to speak in particular sp uh, social situations. And in fact, their parents will tell you they speak just fine at home when they're around strangers, including peers. They either say nothing or they whisper or so that it's barely intelligible. Um, we now know that many, this is probably a variant or of social anxiety disorder or a severe early onset variant. Uh, if you actually do go ahead and try and make a diagnosis, virtually everybody meets criteria for social anxiety disorder. Many have family histories of social anxiety disorder. Um, it looks to be SSRI responsive, although there's not a lot of work that's been done recently on that. And exposure-based treatments are very helpful. Uh, we did a family study of uh, probands with selective mutism. It's a pretty rare disorder, maybe uh, one in a thousand kids, um, school, uh, preschool kids. And uh, in order to do this study, we had to actually pair up with, there's a selective mutism association nationwide, and they um, signed up families who were willing to participate, and then all over the country we phoned first-degree family members, kept our interviewers blind to who they were talking to, um, and you know this is what we found in terms of rates of um, parental diagnoses among probands with selective mutism. So the parents of the selective mutism probands are in this, is that purple? And the parents of control kids are in gray. And then these are the rates of um, diagnoses among their parents. And you can see that equal rates of major depression, um, some of the rarer disorders like OCD, it's actually hard to tell. But what really stands out here is 42%, so almost recapitulating the other study I showed you with social anxiety, 42% um, of the parents of kids with selective mutism had generalized social anxiety disorder or the non-performance subtype. So pretty clear suggestion that these disorders are um, uh, familially related and, and there's also now data genetically related. Skip that. Well, we won't skip that. I, I mentioned uh, when I showed you that slide with all the circles that there is a lot of social anxiety disorder among high-functioning kids with autism spectrum disorders. The reason we say within the high-functioning kids because it's, it's got to be something we can actually measure and have them tell us about. And it turns out that social anxiety is also very common among parents of children with um, Asperger's and, um, and uh, associated disorders. So we added to this um, Venn diagram selective mutism as maybe kind of bridging autism spectrum disorders in terms of some of the language issues um, and social anxiety disorder. And um, we decided with our selective mutism sample, we, we actually were able to get DNA for all of the individuals that I described in that earlier family study that we were gonna go in and take a look at a couple of genes. This was actually done before the era of uh, GWAS and before we had enough money to do GWAS. And so we decided 
what genes would we look at, we decided to focus on some autism spectrum disorder genes given the data that I just showed you. And um, at the time, and, and it's still a strongly held susceptibility gene for autism spectrum disorders, is a gene CNT-NAP2, which uh, is, uh, uh, contains common polymorphism in this contact and associated protein. What does this protein involve with? Cell adhesion, brain maturation, particularly in the amygdala, an area of the brain that we believe is important for understanding a lot of anxiety disorders. And it turns out that CNT-NAP2 is in a pathway um, that involves a transcription factor called FOXP2 that is known to be involved very broadly in a whole range of disorders that involve developmental language problems. So it seemed like a reasonable candidate to look at. Um, and we actually had very little money to do genotyping, so we genotyped CNT-NAP2 in our family study. So the way we did this is we did this TDT design where um, you genotype the parents and you genotype the child and you look for excess transmission of the SNPs of interest along with the disorder. And when we did that with CNT-NAP2, there were uh, five common polymorphisms that we were able to look at. We found that one of the polymorphisms was significantly associated with selective mutism. And when we sort of backed up and looked at that as a haplotype that included that SNP, um, we continued to see a strong, um, a strong for um, you know single marker evidence of association with selective mutism. So I don't know of any subsequent work that's been done uh, looking at the genetics of selective mutism. But now, as we're starting to get to the point where we're doing more of this in social anxiety disorder, it's something I'm hoping we and other groups can can come back to. It's a rare disorder, so it's hard to study, but it's it's very interesting. What else do we know about social anxiety disorder? So I'm jumping back now to pathophysiology of, of social anxiety disorder. So there's been many, many studies done using um, functional MRI to look at emotion processing in individuals with social anxiety disorder. A common task that has been used in probably hundreds of studies is uh, based on a task that Ahmad Hariri designed. And what it involves is people are lying in the magnet, they're looking at a screen, and they're seeing simultaneously three faces, or on other um, trials, three dots. And their job is just to press the button, this is the target, and they got to match the emotion, so here they would press the right button. That emotion, I believe, is constipation, by the way. I don't know if it's... Um, here, what they're supposed to do is just push the button matching the orientation of the shape, so they push the left button. And we repeat this over and over. This is um, a block design. And um, this task robustly activates amygdala. And um, this is a number of years ago. We showed that among the people with social anxiety disorder, there was significantly increased um, activity of the amygdala for the contrast of the angry or harsh faces versus happy faces. This has now been replicated at least a half dozen times. Um, here's one of the subsequent replications from uh, Luan Fan, currently at the University of Chicago. Higher, uh, in this case, unilateral activation of the amygdala in people with social anxiety disorder. And it turns out that this feature, this um, increased amygdala activity with uh, processing of certain kinds of emotion is probably a feature not just of social anxiety disorder, but of many of the fear-related anxiety disorders, um, including specific phobia, including even um, evoked fear itself. So a little bit about treatment. Um, one of the most effective pharmacological treatments for social anxiety disorder are SSRIs. Uh, we showed um, a really long time ago now in this uh, double-blind placebo-controlled study. This is the LSAS I showed you before, and I mentioned that we will put people in trials if they've got scores of 60 or 70. The average score on entry was 80. 
placebo, not much happened over a 12-week trial, and then this reduction in response. In this case, it was paroxetine, but you see similar kinds of things for other SSRIs. This is one of the early studies, and it had about a 55% response rate to paroxetine, double that to placebo. As is often the case, as more and more trials have been done, the placebo response has crept up, and the um, active drug response has, has come down. But virtually every study that's a double-blind placebo-controlled study of an SSRI and social anxiety disorder has been positive. And there hasn't been a lot of interest for a long time in the pharmaceutical industry developing drugs for social anxiety disorder. I'm not sure why. It's pretty common. Um, they want to keep sticking with depression for the most part. Um, but uh, social anxiety disorder is quite drug responsive, does separate from placebo, and, and we're now working with some companies um, basically convincing them that this is a really good group of individuals to study new treatments for fear-related disorders in. These are Luan Fan's uh, work as well, and this is looking at what happens then to that amygdala threat signal when you treat people with SSRIs, and um, it does what you would hope it would do. So this is before treatment in the amygdala, um, and this is after treatment. In this case, it's the SSRI sertraline. So sorry, this is, uh, these are the controls before and then just repeated. They're not treated. These are the people with social anxiety disorder, amygdala activity before treatment, after treatment with SSRI. And you do tend to see um, it's less robust, but before treatment, the people with social anxiety disorder have reduced activity in ventromedial prefrontal cortex during this task, and it does come up a little closer toward healthy control levels uh, with treatment. So the drugs um, that work to treat the disorder are doing at least some of the things in the brain that we would expect them to do. What else do we know about the serotonin system and social anxiety disorder? So we know a little bit. Um, this is a study from a group in Sweden. They've done a lot of work, PET studies uh, and other imaging studies to characterize social anxiety disorder. And uh, what they did in this study published two years ago in, in JAMA Psychiatry was they used a ligand that actually labels the serotonin transporter. And so it becomes a measure of serotonin transporter availability. And they showed that among people with social anxiety disorder, there's increases in um, you know, RAFE, uh, amygdala, probably other parts of the brain as well, an increase in serotonin transporter availability. So um, the, the knee-jerk response then is to say, okay, well, SSRIs work. Um, they will actually, they're, you know, they block reuptake. They would actually um, counter the synaptic effects of increased serotonin transporter availability. So maybe that's how they work. It's probably not that simple. None of the things we actually study ever are that simple. Um, Ann Andrews, uh, who's a, a basic neuroscientist studying the serotonin system at UCLA, and I uh, wrote kind of an editorial at the same time that that paper was published. And we came up with kind of the theoretical model for um, healthy or normal serotonin neuros transmission and what it might look like in social anxiety disorder. And here we're, um, you know, pictorially adding in greater serotonin transporter numbers than here. Um, but what was also uh, seen in the study is they also did binding uh, of a ligand for 5-HTP and found that it was increased, suggesting there's actually increased serotonin synthesis as well. So it's a complicated story as to why an SSRI would necessarily work to counter these, these dual effects. So we know SSRIs work, what else work? Um, when we treat, one of the important things uh, to remember is what I usually say to people is if you've treated folks with OCD, it's very similar to the way you want to handle medications with people with social anxiety disorder. Um, you got to treat them long enough with the medication. You've got to push the dose as high as they'll tolerate. I can't show you any data that this is true, but my experience is if somebody does well 
on um, 100 milligrams of sertraline and they're not doing super great and you push to 150, they do a little better. And if you can push it to 100 and they can tolerate it and they do a little better. What do we do for non-responders? There's been very little in the way of um, evidence-based literature to guide us, but we'll do things in terms of pharmacotherapy like adding a benzodiazepine. I'll show you some data around that. Sometimes we'll switch to a benzodiazepine, switch between SSRIs or switch from an SSRI to an SNRI, switch to a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which we should probably do more often, or consider either adding CBT or switching to CBT. But the literature is almost um, devoid of telling us, you know, what to do if somebody fails a first-line treatment, be that an SSRI or cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, a few years ago, along with uh, Mark Pollack, who was at MGH at the time, and Naomi Simon, who was at MGH at the time, we did a study to look at what do you do for treatment-resistant social anxiety disorders. It was a three-site randomized controlled trial. It was a pretty big study. Um, people came in, so 400 people came in at the front end of the study, and what we did is we treated them open label with an SSRI, it was sertraline, and we did our darndest to optimize the dose and manage side effects and get them as well as we could uh, within 10 weeks on the SSRI. Non-responders to that, so a bunch of people responded, not as many as we would have liked, but the non-responders to that then entered the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And there were three options, three arms. They'd either just be blindly kept on the same dose of sertraline that they were on before, double-blindly. They would have clonazepam added to their sertraline, so add a benzodiazepine or they would be crossed over, tight, down titrated on the sertraline and up, titrated, up titrated on an SNRI venlafaxine. So we were actually were trying to address some of the things that you might do in clinical practice in terms of pharmacotherapy. We didn't have a randomization to add CBT. So the first part of the study, the open label part, was um, uh, the first question is a comparative efficacy trial for non-responders, but there was also a personalized sub aim built in, and we had um, DNA and wondered if we could predict who would do well with an SSRI. So long story short, these are the results of the randomized control trial. So these are folks who, at the start, have LSASs of 70 or 80 despite being on sertraline at optimized dose. And they enter then this randomized part of the trial where they either continue, we don't change their drug at all, they stay on the same dose of sertraline. And you can see that over time, so this was the first 10 weeks was open label, another 12 weeks you do get some reduction in symptoms. People were switched to venlafaxine, didn't do any better than keeping them on what they were on originally. The people who had clonazepam added, and I didn't put in the little p-value asterisk, but overall and at the end of the trial did significantly better. So the only thing that seemed better than just leaving them longer on sertraline, which did help some people, um, and I think is informative in and of itself, would be to add clonazepam. We also took a look at that open label part of the study, trying to predict who did respond to the SSRI. And uh, we used a drop on the LSAS to less than or equal 50, so it's not even a particularly robust measure of response, given that I told you we could put somebody in a trial if they had an LSAS of, of 60 or 70. Um, so the response rate was somewhere around 35, 40%. So first treatment with an SSRI, about a third of people got quite a bit better, but two thirds didn't. So we clearly need more options and, and better treatments. But we did, uh, and even fewer remitted, if you use a, an LSS of 30 or less as the criterion. What I did want to mention here um, is kind of jump back to kids again, and um, in 2004, uh, we completed a randomized controlled trial of 
uh, the SSRI paroxetine in kids with social anxiety disorder. And this came out right around the time that all the concern was being leveled about the use of SSRI in children and adolescents. And um, the drug company didn't even want this published at all. And if they could have avoided publishing it, they would have, because they just thought it was going to be nothing but, but bad news for them. So it turns out that um, they subsequently used these data to help show that um, among, when using SSRIs, not for children and adolescents with depression, but for other indications, there doesn't seem to be any signal at all of increased risk for suicidality. But the main reason I'm showing you this is just to show you how amazingly well kids and adolescents with social anxiety disorder can do when they're treated with SSRIs. I don't think this should ever be the first treatment you ever apply. You're certainly going to want to go with um, you know, psychosocial, behavioral, cognitive approaches first. And all of these kids in this study had had those and failed. But despite that, take a look at the drug. First of all, take a look at the response rate. It's 80% to SSRI, and then look at the drug placebo differences. They're double. Um, and this has been my experience and the experience of my colleagues who treat more kids than I do, um, that this can be an amazingly effective treatment for children with social anxiety disorder. And I don't know if it has something to do about the maturity of the serotonin system or just the fact that, you know, when I see somebody who's had social anxiety disorder and they're 40 years old and they've had it for 38 and a half years, um, it's really tough to kind of change the way they behave and the way they think about things. With kids, there's the opportunity to intervene much earlier. And this actually fits. This just came out, I think, I don't even think it's, it's right, it's an EPUB uh, in JAMA Psychiatry that I just found that did a meta-analysis looking at SSRIs and SNRIs for depression and anxiety in children and adolescents. And there's something really um, important sort of take-home message here. So here's SSRIs and SNRIs. Here's SSRI in the darker color, SNRIs and placebo. Placebo, drug placebo response difference is not that big for depressive disorders in kids and adolescents. But look at anxiety disorders. Big difference between drug and placebo. And I think somehow this is this story is kind of getting missed and people are getting turned off on using um, antidepressants for kids and adolescents. Um, they, if you are, and you probably shouldn't be, uh, you should still be thinking about using them um, for anxiety disorders. I'm going to skip that. We um, have had the opportunity more recently to go from candidate gene studies, which you know don't tell you a whole lot about um, unbiased um, estimates of, of risk across the whole genome, to GWAS studies. And uh, as part of a study called Army Stars, we've had access to self-report data and survey data and, um, and DNA from a very large cohort of uh, young adults. And we were able in this study to have a measure of social anxiety. We didn't have a diagnostic measure of social anxiety disorder, so instead this is using a continuous measure of social anxiety symptoms. Uh, and this work's conducted with um, a whole bunch of collaborators, including uh, Stefan Ripke, who was at the Broad, and Jordan Smoller, who's at MGH, who I'm actually spending part of the sabbatical time with as well. And uh, so we looked at uh, social anxiety. We actually created these factor scores. And I'll just kind of jump to the. This is the distribution of the social anxiety symptom or factor score in the population, nicely normally distributed. It's something we can work with um, statistically. And uh, here's the GWAS that you're used to seeing with the Manhattan plots. And we're all you know, looking for something to cross this 5 times 10 to the minus 8th barrier. For us, we do get a single hit on um, the short arm of chromosome 6. Um, and as is often the case, it's in a gene that, you know, is not clear what it would have to do if anything with social anxiety disorder. There's something known about it. It's a peptidase inhibitor um, and, uh, and uh, may have something to do with 
Uh, there may also be something to do with apoptosis, but unclear why this would be a risk factor. But this is actually the first genome-wide significant hit for social anxiety disorder. We're hoping to follow up with it in other cohorts. One of the things we also learned from that study is we did see heritability. So we expected based on the twin studies to be heritable. We saw much higher heritability in the twin studies than we see here with um, this is the so-called SNP chip heritability that you get out of the GWAS itself. That's typically the case where when you say, okay, well, we know it's heritable from twin studies where we're thinking about all the genes that are transmitted. How about if we measure a finite number? In this case, it's a big number. It's several million SNPs and calculate the heritability, it always tends to be lower for um, traits than in the twin studies. But it's heritable, significantly heritable. We also look to see how genetically correlated it was with other traits that have been measured. Um, so these are not phenotypic correlations, these are genetic correlations. And it was social anxiety is strongly negatively genetically correlated with extroversion. Phenotypically, that makes sense. High social anxiety, low extroversion. Um, but what this suggests is that there are many genes shared in common that presumably are influencing both of those traits. Surprisingly, not a genetic correlation with neuroticism, um, which we did expect to see. I do want to save time for discussion, so I'm going to just mention something about MAO inhibitors. Um, there, so when I first started um, working in this area, uh, actually as a medical student, MAOIs were all that was being used to treat social anxiety disorder. We didn't have SSRIs. It was pretty clear the tricyclics weren't useful, and MAO inhibitors were what we used. They've kind of fallen out of favor. I think most, how many of you are, any psychiatric residents here? Raise your hand. Okay, well, so generally, most residents, maybe not at McLean, but at most places, graduate from their psychiatric residency without ever having prescribed an MAO inhibitor. And that's really a shame, and it's particularly a shame for social anxiety disorder, probably other anxiety disorders too. So if I have somebody who has not responded well to a couple SSRIs, and um, I've added a benzo, and they've been through a good course of CBT, I absolutely will try them on an MAO inhibitor. And again, I have no um, published data, but I can tell you frequently that has been like a, a, a lifesaver for individuals. So uh, I'm going to skip this, although it's going to take a while to do. So I'm not going to talk about um, really CBT or cognitive models of social anxiety disorder, although I could have given how long it's taking to go through this slide. Um, I will let you look at this. So basically, the cognitive models basically suggest that um, individuals with social anxiety disorder are predisposed to being concerned about negative evaluation. They catastrophize. So for example, they go in and talk with a coworker, and they immediately think, I'm going to sound stupid. Um, he or she's going to judge me negatively. They don't do a good job paying attention to the cues the other person is giving. Uh, they often give off the vibe that they're disinterested uh, rather than they're afraid, and that's probably protective in some ways. And you can sort of think about how, with CBT, uh, an experienced therapist can go through and really tackle all of these different entry points. Da -da -da -da. Okay. Um, there are good data that um, cognitive behavioral therapies are effective in social anxiety disorder. Some evidence that, uh, at least from these early studies, that individual therapies a little better than uh, group therapy, and some evidence that individual cognitive therapy is better than uh, interpersonal therapy. Let's get that. Uh, very few studies comparing pharmacotherapy to cognitive behavioral therapy. This is one um, now pretty iconic study where uh, individuals with social anxiety disorder were randomized to either get placebo, cognitive behavioral group therapy, phenylzine, or a combination of phenylzine and CBGT. 
and you can see the combined group, and it is statistically significant, did better in terms of response and remission. We don't usually recommend starting both simultaneously. It kind of just doesn't make sense because so many people will respond to one or the other. And usually what we recommend is go with cognitive behavioral therapy first. And if that's not working, we will add on an SSRI. And if that doesn't work, we'll add on an MAO inhibitor. Um, there's not been a whole lot happening in the pharmacotherapy of social anxiety disorder field for quite a while, but um, interest has started to increase recently. And um, ketamine, which seems now to be being studied for everything, and maybe there's a really good reason for it, I came across just um, a couple days ago this uh, study of ketamine for social anxiety disorder. So this is the LSAS. Um, this is, these are individuals who get placebo, so they're pretty symptomatic, they're 80. Uh, scores don't seem to change much. There's, here's the infusion, here's the 14 days after. And in this small study, they got some you know, pretty interesting drops in LSAS early on. So could be that uh, ketamine's gonna have broader effects, including those that might be useful for this disorder. Uh, more research will tell. Uh, when I practice, I'm not a CBT therapist. I frequently refer people to CBT therapists, but if for whatever reason they don't want that or their insurance won't cover it, and I'm mainly doing pharmacotherapy, what I'm doing is I'm being sure that I'm providing enough information to people about you know, why the drug should work, and then very importantly, what they can do to help themselves uh, while they're on the medicine. And with social anxiety, one of the questions I ask is, um, are you feeling any different in terms of how self-conscious you feel? And that's often the first thing patients tell me. Like, you know, I went into the room and there were lots of people there at lunch and I still didn't want to sit with anybody, but I sat and ate my lunch by myself like I usually do, but I noticed I wasn't feeling as self-conscious. I wasn't as aware of other people staring at me. I said, okay, that's cool, let's build on that. Um, and then, you know, I will do my kind of, you know, layman psychiatrist CBT to the extent I can, but that mainly consists of prescribing exposure, right? Okay, you're starting to feel a little better now? That's good, okay. Now you gotta push yourself, do more. Come back and tell me how you felt doing that. Um, and doing that along with pharmacotherapy, I think is very important. Giving a drug to somebody with social anxiety disorder and they sit at home and watch TV, uh, they're not gonna benefit. And one of the places, uh, one of the ways that I provide or try to provide information to patients is by um, telling them about websites that I think have good quality information. As you all know, you can get you know, anything off the web. Um, these are uh, Anxiety and Depression Association of America, certainly NIMH in Canada, the Anxiety Disorders Association of Canada are all really good sources of information about the disorder. A lot of them also have very good self-help materials where people can really get a jump start with CBD. So let me stop there. Thank you all for being here and uh, if you have questions. Sure. Yeah. Do you want? How do you want me to do this? Anybody with? Yeah. Got it. Okay. Hi. With Sad, do you have any experience using uh, CBT, uh, cannabis oil, or the uh, uh, in treating anxiety disorders with Sad? Yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm interested. The, the question was about using uh, CBD and, um, you know, related products for anxiety disorders, and, and I don't. I'm, um, it's something we're interested in. We've actually trying to get a study funded in uh, for another um, anxiety disorder, but I don't have any personal experience. Do you? Hello. Hi, um, uh, I'm a, a PTSD epidemiologist, and uh, I'm just, I really liked your um, presentation, and I have some t two questions for this. Um, number one is that I was so um, fascinated that 
the risk factor for the SAD has very common thing for PTSD also. But I was so shocked that it's like for the um, response to the third trial line, the, um, the SSRI are very different. So I'm, I'm not sure what's happening between these two um, disease categories in that. And also the second um, is, um, because I'm very um, mostly um, likely to ha focus on the, uh, the precision medicine, um, I want to ask um, who is mo mo more responsive to SSRI, as you told, it's like there are some responders and non-responders. So could you just tell me some kind of like a basic characteristics difference? Yeah, sure. So a lot of the risk factors, as you said, for social anxiety are common risk factors for pretty much every depressive and anxiety disorder. There's nothing really distinguishing about them. And many of them are also true for you know PTSD, particularly women being at greater risk. So I don't know what that tells us. Um, in terms of uh, oh, SSRI response. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the response rates are that different. I think uh, response rates for PTSD are probably somewhat lower. And, um, you know, some of the press and some of the meta-analyses have said, well, SSRIs don't work for PTSD, and some of the treatment guidelines have said that as well. Um, you know, as much as I like evidence, SSRIs do work for some people with PTSD. And for the individuals where they work, you will get pretty big drops, and they don't work at all for other people. I don't think social anxiety disorders is that different. Um, the response rate may be a little higher, and that's part of the reason when companies are saying, I've got a new drug for anxiety, I want to study PTSD, I say, well, why don't you study social anxiety disorder first? Drug placebo differences are usually higher. PTSD just seems a harder disorder to treat. And remind me, oh, the second part of the question was about prediction. Yes, yeah, so I skipped through those slides. Um, we looked at genetic predictors. And we had, you know, some that were significant, nothing that would be, you know, actually clinically useful now. And I think that's still an important uh, area where more research needs to be done, you know, across the board for depression and anxiety disorders as to who's going to respond. And, um, and we don't have answers yet, but there's lots of research going on. A very, very nice presentation, all totally cool, especially the differential res responsivity to medication treatment, very much to be remembered. Um, wondering whether there has, uh, there were, there was early promise, I remember a couple of studies long ago of pregabalin, which looked promising and then sort of disappeared from the scene. What is, number one, what is the current view about that? And then I'll ask a second question too, which is how much of a predictor of future depressive illness has social anxiety proven to be? Yeah, so pregabalin, yeah, you're right. Um, the company did at least two pretty big randomized controlled trials with pregabalin. Uh, it's Lyrica, so it's on the market for uh, diabetic neuropathy and other kinds of pain syndromes. Um, they never sought an indication for social anxiety disorder. And um, part of that had to do was this was the same company that got um, fined for having prescribed gabapentin off label for anxiety predominantly. And I think they just, their fingers, feet were burned, whatever the saying is, and they, they decided just not to go down that path. So people do use social, uh, do use pregabalin for social anxiety disorder. And um, I can't say I've used it a lot. I think it kind of works not as well as a benzodiazepine, but would be a good choice when you really don't want to give a benzo to somebody. Um, and then, sorry, what was the second part? Uh, what, how much of a predictor of... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's a very strong predictor. So there are uh, longitudinal data coming out of a German study and also out of the National Comorbidity Study. So we've done this work with Ron Kessler. And um, having social anxiety disorder is, um, uh, compared to any other psychiatric disorder, is the strongest risk factor for developing a depressive episode at some time, but also for developing an early onset depressive disorder. So very, very strong. And you know, it makes sense. I mean, I'm sure there's biological reasons, but also if you develop social anxiety disorder early and you're isolated and you have few friends and you have few people you can rely on, you know, what better way to get depressed? Is that working? Yeah. Uh, uh, it's hard not to intuit, although I'm not an analyst, that if you grow up with very socially anxious parents who are fearful of your going out and their going out, you won't have some 
absorption of that regardless of genes. Did your twin studies have any of the raised apart separation? Yeah, no, so the, the twin studies are, you know, monozygotic, dizygotic twins raised in the same families, and so you can pull out the heritability. But there are, are studies done, not twin studies, but um, a lot of studies looking at the non-genetic familial transmission of anxiety, and they show in, um, you know, laboratory models that, yes, anxious parents are more likely to transmit cues that these things are dangerous, don't do them. So there's no question that there's uh, an environmental component. And so the way I think about it is, you know, kids with social anxieties are likely to have a parent who has it, so they're genetically at risk, but then they're also behaviorally at risk through these exposures, or in this case, lack of exposures. So they get sort of a double whammy. One more question about people, the opposite, I talked to this with my residence lab, but is people who crave being on stage in public performance, which is somehow exactly the opposite, although the story is that Laurence Olivier used to throw up before every performance. Do you have any comment on that opposite? Yeah, so there are, and I've seen folks who are um, very much in the public eye. They're, you know, actors, performers, uh, politicians, and they're comfortable, particularly the performers playing a role, because they're not themselves. They're somebody else. So if people are judging them, they may be judging how good an actor they are, but that would be it. But generally, they're judging the character they portray, and it's actually a way to avoid um, you know, scrutiny about, about yourself. So there's actually a whole list of um, actors who've talked about their problems with social anxiety. Yeah, it seems counterintuitive, but it, it's not really. And at that, it's one o'clock, so let's say thank you to Dr. Steen.